Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Good morning, church. Please let's turn to Matthew chapter 6. We'll be reading from verse 1 to 4. Matthew chapter 6 from verse 1 to 4. So I read, um, it says, okay, thank you, media team. Thank you, media team. Um, it says, take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them, otherwise you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. Will reward you openly. Let us, um, our study today will continue in, in our study on, the, on Jesus' teaching on the principles of the kingdom. The principles of the kingdom, if you recall, we started this um, from Matthew chapter 5. And uh, here we are in Matthew chapter 6. The title of today's message is... Uh, Godly motives for Christian giving. Godly motives for Christian giving. Let us pray. Mighty God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you, Lord, because you are the giver of all good and perfect gifts, O God. We thank you, Lord, because you are the giver of life. The breath which we have in us comes from you. The life which we have is sustained by you. The health that we have, O Lord, is secured by you. Father, Lord, we have nothing of ourselves that we can make boast of, O oh God. Nothing of ourselves that we can lay claim to, O oh God. All that we have has come from you. So, Father, this morning we humbly say thank you, God. We give you all the praise. We give you all the honor. Father, Lord, please accept our thanksgiving this morning in Jesus' name. Lord, even as we go into the word that you have given us, O oh Lord. Father, as a good father, you've not left us on this earth as orphans, O oh Father. You've given us your word and you've given us your Holy Spirit, by which, Lord, we are not to walk around aimlessly confused as orphans, O oh God. So, Father, Lord, we've come before you this morning asking, O oh Lord, that what you only you can do and what you have done in the past, which is to make your word effective in our lives, Father, Lord, we look up to you for that this morning in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, come and do what only you can do. Come and open our eyes to the truth of the Father this morning, O oh Lord. I humble myself, Lord, as a vessel before you, O oh Lord. I pray, Father, you will find me a vessel worthy for your own honor in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, come and bless us through your word, O oh Lord. And the glory alone will be yours, mighty Jesus. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Amen. So in our reading, we see here in chapter 6 that Christ uh, begins to teach specifically on the giving of alms or charitable deeds um, in general. And um, the audience that he was talking to were a Jewish audience, and this topic would definitely have gotten their attention. They would have claimed their attention. They would have paid close attention to what he has to say especially in the area of charitable deeds or giving of alms. And the reason for that is that uh, almsgiving has a very significant uh, importance in the Jewish faith and in the Jewish culture, as we will look at more closely a little bit later. But just know that almsgiving, charitable deeds, generosity has actually a significance in the Jewish faith and in the Jewish culture. And so despi but despite the fact that this is a significant part of their culture, we see that what Jesus is talking about here is that he's addressing, he's addressing them in a way of correction. So despite the fact that this charitable deeds, this giving of alms, is actually a crucial part 
of the Jewish faith and culture, it turns out that the way they have been doing it is not in a manner that is pleasing to God. So the way they have been going about their charitable deeds, what is sort of what we would consider the popular opinion, the popular consensus concerning charitable gifts in this point in time, uh, Jesus is pointing out here was not something that was pleasing to God. And you know, if this, in other words, what we are seeing here is what Apostle Paul talked about uh, in Romans chapter 10, verse 2 to 3. Romans 10, verse 2 to 3, where he talks about his Jewish people, how they have a zeal for God. They have a genuine zeal for God, but their zeal was without knowledge because they were ignorant of God's righteousness. They have a zeal. They have a passion to do things of God. But unfortunately, they were doing it without knowledge. They were doing it in ignorance of God's righteousness. So consequently, it turned out that the Jewish people, for you know, over a period of time, for many, many years and many, many generations, they had been practicing this arms, these charitable deeds, with the hope of pleasing God with it. But unfortunately, it turned out that all of their actions was achieving the exact opposite, which is to displease God. And that's what Jesus is correcting them, he's teaching them about here. And so, but in summary, what we are seeing here is that Jesus is teaching that when it comes to giving, when it comes to charitable deeds, when it comes to being generous, that it's our attitudes and our practice that matters. It matters a great deal. Because otherwise, if our attitudes are not in knowledge, not in the right setting with the expectations of God, then we will only be pleasing man and not pleasing God. We see he talked about how these people are getting their glory from men for what they are doing. So yeah, as we go forward, I want us to just note here that, you know, the, Jesus here is talking about charitable deeds. Some other verses have it as alms giving. But I want us to keep, keep in mind that Jesus is talking here much more broadly beyond just monetary things, beyond, beyond financial things. Jesus is talking here about our time. He's talking to us here about our talents. He's talking to us here about our, t uh, our you know, emotional support or physical support, anything of value that we could render to our neighbor, to our render to our fellow brother or our fellow sister. This is what Jesus is talking about here. How we give out of, those, of these things, of these valuable things, uh, is very important. It's very important because the whole goal is for us to please God with it. So if we give out, if we have the wrong attitude, we may end up not pleasing God, but actually displeasing him. I pray the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. And so even as we talk concerning the attitude of giving, we talk about what it means to, be, to, in, to give in a manner that is pleasing to God. I want us, we will look at this in the remainder of this message under four points. So the first is the significance of giving in Jewish culture. Earlier I said that giving um, charitable deeds was something that is significant in Jewish culture. We will spend some time in the scripture to understand what that means. Then the second point is wrong giving which is simply giving in a way that is not pleasing to God, wrong giving. Then we'll see godly giving, giving in a manner that is pleasing to God. And finally, we will talk uh, on, on uh, discerning godly motives. Because at the end of the day, as we'll see, that Jesus' instructions to us in these four verses is that it's the state of our heart that actually matters when we bring an offering before God, when we bring a gift before God, or when we even offer help to our fellow man. It is the state of our heart that distinguishes, that determines, that differentiates whether our actions will be pleasing to God or not. So I pray the Lord will help us even as we go through his word this morning in Jesus' name. So to our first point, the significance of giving in Jewish culture. So we see that um, historically that giving to the poor and to the needy is actually a core tenet of the Jewish faith. So it's a core tenet of the Jewish faith. And the reason for that is because it is one, one of the three major acts of righteousness in the Jewish faith. So there are three major acts of righteousness in the Jewish faith. The first one is giving. The second one is praying. And the third one is fasting. And, you know, just to just move, uh, project forward on this particular chapter, anyone who has studied this chapter, uh, you know, closely will notice that the next two sections talk about prayer and then fasting. So in this chapter, Jesus is talking about three of the major acts of righteousness in the Jewish faith. And by acts of righteousness, I mean in the Jew, as a Jew, 
You do any of these acts, you do this acts so that you can stand justified before God or to please God. So in other words, if you want to please God, this is what you do. You do, you do charitable deeds, you pray, uh, or you fast. So in the Jewish culture, generosity or charity is not like we do it today or as we see it today. It's not just a choice that individuals make out of their own lifestyle choices. You know, it's not like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm a morally upright person. That is why I, you know, I, I give, I donate, or I volunteer of my time. Um, no, that is not the way it is. It was in the Jewish culture. It was something that's actually codified in Jewish law. So let's turn quickly to Leviticus chapter 19. And we'll read from verse 9, uh, we'll read verse 9 and 10. Leviticus chapter 19, we'll be reading verse 9 and 10. And this is the Lord speaking to the people. He says, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field, nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest. And you shall not glean your vineyard, nor shall you gather every grape of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the stranger. I am the Lord your God. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 19 to 21. Deuteronomy chapter 24, 19 to 21. Sim, the Lord speaking as well. He says, when you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat your olive trees, you shall not go over the bows again. It shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. When you gather the grapes of your vineyard, you shall not glean it afterward. It shall be for the stranger, the fatherless and the widow. This is Jewish law that we've just read. This is the law under which the people of Israel lived under. Generosity we see here is, comp is codified even in their law. So what he's saying here is as a farmer when you harvest, you should not pick up all the very last grain of your harvest. You need to leave some behind. In fact, in Leviticus we say that it, you should not even harvest the corners of your field. You should leave your fields unharvested so that the poor can come and benefit from that. And this was not just true um, in, in the Old Testament. We also see this carrying over into the New Testament. But before we even go to the New Testament, we can also look at a couple of verses as well of Scripture. The Scripture also emphasized this in their teachings. So if we look, for example, in Proverbs chapter 19, verse 17. Proverbs 19, verse 17 simply tells us that anyone who gives to the poor is making a loan to the Lord. Anyone who gives to the poor is doing what is making a loan to the Lord. Proverbs uh, 11, 24 and 25 says a similar spirit. Proverbs 11, 24 and 25 says that by uh, 24 and 25 says the generous soul. <laughs> the Yes, there is one who scatters yet increases more, and there is one who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty. Verse 25, the generous soul will be made rich, and he who orders, orders, he who orders will also be watered himself. So we see here, not just in the law, but also in the teachings. In the teachings of the scripture, we see that the Jewish people are brought up to be generous. It is a part of their, uh, of, of their culture and of their faith. We also see this in the, in, the, in, in the early church in Acts of Apostles chapter 4 from verse 32 to 36. Acts chapter 4 verse 32 to 36. We're talking about a point in time when the church was just emerging. The church was still very young. And at this point in time, there were those who were needy among the church. They were needy for various reasons. Verse 32 says, Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but he had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord, and great grace was among them all. Verse 34, now was there any, nor was there anyone among them who lacked. For all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and it distributed to each one as had need. Um, James 2, 15 and 16 also goes on, I won't read that in the interest of time, tells us that if our brother or our sister comes to us and tells us that he is hungry, he is cold, he, he doesn't have you know, money for, for transportation, we should not just say, 
it is well with you. God bless you. The Lord be with you. No, that is not true faith. That is not true Christian faith. And so for the Jews, this was a key part. Generosity was a key part of their faith and of their culture. And we know this also, we also think we also know from scripture is that God himself is the originator of generosity. God himself is the originator of gifts because the Bible tells us that God loved the world so much that he gave, he gave his only begotten son. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 tells us that God gave us salvation. Salvation is what a free gift from God. It is not, it's not by our works, it's by grace that we've been saved. 1 John chapter 4, verse 13 tells that God has given us of his spirit. He's given us his Holy Spirit. And so on and on, we see not just spiritual gifts, physical gifts. Job chapter 34, 14 and 15 tells us that even the breath that is in us is a gift of God. That if God was to withdraw his breath from us, that all of flesh will perish. Job 34, 14 to 15. And so God is the originator of given. God is the originator of, uh, of generosity. So we see, and what this points out to us here, and which is one thing that the Jewish people were missing at this point, is that since God is the originator of giving, there is a spiritual element to giving. It is easy for us to think that giving is just physical, but it's actually a spiritual element to it. And we'll see more of that as we go on to our next point, which is wrong giving. When we fixate solely on the physical aspects, so you give bread to an individual or you give money to an individual, and we fixate solely on that aspect, then we'll be missing the essence of what God's purpose is concerning giving. So we see, in, in, moving on to the next point, which is wrong giving. We see the purpose of Christ's instruction to the Jews in our reading was to correct their erroneous attitudes and practices regarding the giving of alms and generosity in general. We see, and we can see that this is actually an act of love of Christ towards the Jewish people. And the reason I say that is because he saw that they were blind, essentially. Here they were operating in a manner thinking they were pleasing to God, zealously sacrificing, in some cases, and giving off, uh, giving off of, their, of their valuables. But it turned out that contrary to the expectation that they were pleasing God, they were actually not pleasing God. And so Christ had come to open their eyes to the truth and in love to show them the way. So, and Christ identifies that the root of their erroneous giving is that they were ignorant of God's purposes when it comes to giving. Also, Christ also recognized that they had bad role models. What do we mean by that? Let's turn quickly back to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, when we'll see, and it says, take heed... Do not do your charitable, from verse 1, do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them, otherwise you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So in other words, at that point in time, for some, somehow, the popular sense of how, of the right way to give was to do it in a fashion where others could see you. And in fact, it goes further and says, talks about the hypocrites. That is the wealthy, the powerful, the religious and political leaders of the day who were very, very wealthy and who could afford to give off big gifts. And when they give out big gifts, what followed it was the big gift was then announced in form of a trumpet. It was announced so that people could celebrate them that, oh, wow, this individual has just given a big donation. It's almost like the whole street comes to a pause and goes like, dun, 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 dun. Um, uh, let me use a name, like, uh, Brother Simon has given a big gift, he's given a million dollars, woohoo, and everybody cheers. And then, you know, Brother Peter, Brother Peter will be like, wow, uh, Brother Simon has given a million, wow, I need to give 1.5 million, and then on and on it goes. The celebration, the glory that they got, as Christ says here, they got the glory from men. Men praised them. And then Christ was then pointing out that he called these role models hypocrites. And the question is, why does he call them hypocrites? Well, we see that they are hypocrites because they were not actually generous individuals who were giving out out of the generosity of their heart. But rather, they were giving out because they were men pleasers. 
They were men pleasers. Why do we say this? That the gifts that they give was not a reflection of a generous heart that they had, but rather it was because they wanted the public adoration. They want the public praise, and they wanted the boost to their reputation. So the money they were giving out meant nothing to them. It did not really cost them because they were that wealthy. But the praise that came along with it, that exactly was what they were after. So in our contemporary time, we could say basically their giving was nothing more than marketing fees or advertising fees. They were basically advertising themselves. The product that was being advertised was their reputation. They loved the fact that men, women all around them cheered and celebrated them. This is exactly what they were looking for. And so what we see that, that is therefore completely missing in this whole equation is God. God was not anywhere in their giving. God was nowhere in the glory that was being given. God was nowhere in the praise that was being given. It was all of man. And that's why Christ said that they have actually received what? Their reward. They gave carnally and they received carnal reward. May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. In fact, we can see a tragic example of this sort of thinking, this tragic example of this sort of thinking in the early church. If we turn quickly to Acts chapter 5, in the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Acts chapter 5, uh, I will read from verse 1 through 10. So this manner of thinking that giving was all about, it was just completely carnal, was giving was to impress and to get uh, public adoration. So we read, but a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. And he kept back part of it, part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it, not your own, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. I'll jump forward to uh, verse, uh, and, and now, uh, yeah, let's just continue. And the young men arose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. Now it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter answered her, tell, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She said, yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last, and the young man came in, found her dead, and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. So what we see in this tragic story concerning these Jewish Christians is that uh, they basically were trying to get in on what we read about earlier in the previous chapter, where we saw that because of the need that arose in the church, some members of the church took it upon themselves to sell of their possessions and take the entire proceeds and give, and give it out to those who were needy. And Ananias and Sapphira at this point decided that, well, this seemed like a really good thing to do. It seemed very cool for people to just go sell, and it seemed they may have just looked like, wow, these are really righteous people. So we want to get in on that act as well. We also want to be like um, be counted among those who have sold of their belongings and given the entire proceeds uh, to the church. But one thing we should note, as Peter pointed out, is that all of this giving was all free will. The church did not mandate that anybody should sell of their possessions. And even after they sold it, the church did not mandate that they should bring the entire proceeds. They could have brought 5%, 10%, 0%. It did not matter. But yet, these individuals, without no compulsion, decided on their own that they were going to appear before everyone as one who have sacrificed without actually paying the price, without actually, you know, making, making the, they, they wanted to get the public acclaim without actually giving, making the sacrificial giving. Unfortunately for them, the problem was that, like we said earlier, Christian giving is a spiritual act. They did not know that their giving will be noticed by heaven. They did not know that the Holy Spirit was going to pay attention to what they were doing. They thought that it was just Peter and the church. So, you know, they could come along and just tell Peter, yes, uh, this is, you know, I sold my house for $50, here's the $50. 
um, and then move on, and then they will impress Peter, impress the church. But unfortunately for them, the Holy Spirit actually took attention to this and decided to punish them. And this is why this is so tragic. They did not have the understanding, the understanding that when they give, they're actually giving to God. God is, in, in, is involved. The heaven is in involved in our giving. And as we go more into that, as we talk about godly giving, the moral for us is that spiritual, that giving is a spiritual act. God has ordained it. God has set the model for us. The Bible tells us that God freely gave of his own son his most valuable thing. That if he has given us his son, how would he hold back anything else to us? God has given all that, he ha all that, uh, that is of his best to us. And so the moral for us is God has ordained giving. God has set the model for giving, for godly giving, as we'll see shortly. And so we should be very careful of our motives when we go forth to give. We should be very careful. We may think we are giving to man. We may think that it's man that is accounting what we are giving. But I tell you, heaven is paying attention. And our giving is not going to be ignored in heaven. It will either please God or displease God. I pray the Lord will help us to guard against evil motives in our giving in Jesus' name. We move on to the godly giving. So wrong giving is a giving that thinks that giving is only carnal. It's all just in the physical. It's all about us interacting with some individual, the person you volunteer your time with, the person you give, you know, you, you, you give some person you see on the street and you give some money to No. What the Bible teaches that giving is spiritual. So what is godly giving? Let's turn back to our Matthew chapter 6. We see there that Jesus, after showing the Jewish people that their giving practice was displeasing to God, Jesus goes ahead to teach them how to give in a manner that is pleasing to God, that is pleasing to God the Father, so that they may be rewarded by God the Father. We see there, he says it in verse 4 of Matthew chapter 6. That your charitable deed may be in secret, that your father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. So a kind of giving that is rewarded by the father and not rewarded by man. So how do, what, so what does Jesus say about this? Well, we see as we read through these verses that the essence of his instruction to us is that God is at the center of any giving that will please him. God is right at the center of every aspect of the giving that will please God. What do we mean by that? Let's, let's, let's sort of pull that apart a bit into three observations. God is who we give to. That is the first observation. God is who we give to. It is not Salvation Army that we are giving to. It is not Victory Court that you are giving to. It is not the guy on the street that you are giving to. It's not your brother in need that you are giving to. The Bible tells us that God is who you are giving to. So you're giving of money, you're giving of talent, you're giving of your time, you're giving of your energy, you're giving to God. That is what the Bible teaches us and we'll see that shortly. Secondly, God is the provider of what we give. That is the second point. God himself is the provider of the very valuable thing that we give. And thirdly, we will see that it is with our heart that we give. In other words, the wrapping, the package that our gift comes in is our heart. We may focus so much on the size, on the nature of what we give, the amount of money that we give, but no, before God, it is our heart that he is looking at. You see, the human is the one, the recipient, human recipient is the one that benefits from the physical thing you're bringing. But your heart belongs to God. It's, God that, it's your heart that God is focusing on. Do we see that? So there's a, there's a physical element to it and there's a spiritual element to it. The physical element is consumed by the recipient of your gift. You give someone money, you give them a coat to wear, they wear it. But right there, the spiritual element, God is focusing in, on the heart with which you have given that gift. So we'll see that. So those are the three points that we'll dig into a little bit later to see what's the essence of what does it mean for God to be at the center of any giving that will please him. God is who we give to. God is the provider of what we give. And God is, uh, and our heart is what we give with. Our heart is what we give with. And if we give in this manner, then this is a giving that will in fact be glorifying to God. A giving that will in fact be glorifying to God. So let's look at the very first one. Um, before we go into that, let's just quickly observe that these three observations contradict the secular or worldly thinking when it comes to giving. You know, secular and non-Christians also give. Secular people also give. 
but their notion, their understanding of what it means to give is completely contradictory to what we've just, the three points we've just made. So let's see. First, in the world, in circular thinking, the needy person is who you give to. Your gift starts with you and it ends with the person you've given it to. So if you give someone money, the gift starts with you and it ends with that person. It doesn't go anywhere anymore beyond that. But that is contrary to a Christian godly giving. The second point is that we are the provider of what we give. In other words, in the circular thinking, I, if I put my hand in my pocket and I bring out $10 and I give it out to someone, that $10 comes from me. It originated from me. Nowhere beyond that. That is contrary to what the Bible teaches. And finally, we see that it's in, in, in the secular setting, when it comes to how we give, it's just the size of the, of, of the gifts that matters. You know, a, a dollar, a million dollars, the difference between the giving is the size, right? Because one is significant and the other is not significant from the carnal perspective. One can buy a certain amount of, 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 of uh, comfort, the other cannot buy it. And so in the worldly setting, that is all that matters. How much have you given? But in the, in, the, in, in the kingdom of God, it's the heart. With what heart are you giving? That is what matters. So let's dig a little bit deeper into these three points. God is who we give to. Let's start, we, we read earlier in Proverbs chapter 19, verse 17, that he who gives, who, he who gives to the poor loans to the Lord. Loans to the Lord. The scripture makes it very clear to us that God himself is the ultimate recipient of every gift that we give. Let's turn quickly to Matthew chapter 25, where we will read from verse 35 to 40. Matthew chapter 25, we'll read quickly from verse 35 to 40. So here, this is the Lord speaking. It says, For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. This is given, right? This is given as we know it. Right? Then the righteous will answer the Lord and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to, it, to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Scripture makes it very clear. If we think we are helping some individual in front of us, a man or woman, from God's perspective, we are doing it to him. This is what the scripture is telling us here. So the scripture makes it clear. God is the ultimate recipients of every gift. And like we said earlier, it's not, be, not the physical aspect of the gift, but the spiritual aspect of the gift. So it's, it's to our own benefits to internalize this truth, this truth that we just read. As long as you do this to the least of these, my brethren, and what it means by least of these, my brethren, is those who cannot even pay you back. Those who, I mean, they just don't have enough to even pay you back. You are not loaning them, right? Such that, oh, when they pick themselves up later on, they can come and pay you back. No. The least of this, my brain, those cannot, that who cannot pay back, those who may not even be aware of you. They may not even get the gift directly from you. But God knows, and that's why he says, as long as you do it to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. You did it to me. So when we, if we then read, so if we can internalize this truth that God is ultimately at the end of the process of giving that starts with us, that starts with us, then that will transform our attitude towards giving. When we realize that even when you show up, you know, in church to, to work, to serve, to give of your time in any manner, shape, or form, to advance God's kingdom, when you do that, God is at the ultimate end of that gift. It's not the church that is benefiting from it. And when you come, you know, you, you serve in whatever capacity you serve in. I don't even want to go through the specific, but whatever way you see there is a need and you step up, you step in into that need and you occupy that need with your time, with your talent, with your strength, with your resources. Trust you, trust me. God is the one who is the ultimate recipient. 
I pray the Lord will help us to internalize this truth in our hearts in Jesus' name. So if we return quickly to the account of Ananias and Sapphira, we see that it's the ignorance of this truth that turned what would have just been a prank on their part into a fatal error that cost them their life. All they had in mind was simply to just deceive the people around them. That's all they, they thought they were doing. They had no idea that heaven was also engaged in it. Because you see, while they could lie to Peter and get away with it, it's a very different thing to lie to the Holy Spirit. And they learned with such harsh consequences for their lives. But there's also a positive side to this, as we'll see in the account of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, verse 1 to 5. Knowing who we are given to, that it is God. God is the ultimate recipient of our gifts. And it's very strange, you know, when you compare and contrast the story of Ananias and Sapphira, who were Jews, who had given as part of their faith and their culture, who were Christians, when you contrast their attitude towards giving with that of Cornelius, who, as we'll read, was a Gentile, not a Jew. He did not have giving and generosity as part of his upbringing or his faith or his culture. In fact, at this point in time, he really didn't have any faith because it was in between. Let's read quickly. Acts chapter 10 from verse 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. Uh, about the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? So he said to him, Your prayers and your what? And your arms have done what? Come up for a memorial before who? Before God. Come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. Um, this was a revelation for Cornelius, obviously. He had no idea. He thought he was just giving generously. He was just giving alms. But he didn't know that his prayer and his alms had actually gone up to heaven for a memorial before God. And you know when something is a memorial, it means that it's not just a one-time thing. It means it's something that has been over a period of time to the point where you actually notice and what do we see here that came as his own reward? Because remember, Jesus said that your father, who is in heaven, will reward you what? Openly. We see that the reward for him in the rest of the chapter, as you might read it in your spare time, was that he earned the salvation of his household and of himself. Because what happened was he was sent to call for Peter. And Peter came, and when Peter came, Peter started preaching to them. And who knows what happened? Who, can anyone, biblical student here, tell me what happened? Something dramatic happened with them as Peter was speaking. The Holy Spirit fell on them right there before they were baptized. And that was like amazing because previously it's like you first get, you know, you get saved, and then you get baptized, baptism of John in the water. And then they now pray with the laying of hands, and then the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Not for this set of Gentiles. This was the first set of Gentiles to be saved. And so the whole thing was turned upside down. While Peter was still speaking to them, before they even had a chance to think about it, the Holy Spirit fell upon them. What a reward. What a spiritual reward. And so we see here, too, that the reward of the Father may not necessarily be physical. This is the other point we see here. It was actually spiritual. And I, I, I don't know how many of you, you agree with me that spiritual rewards are better than physical rewards. Because the Bible tells us, what shall you profit a man if he should gain the whole world? All of the physical rewards of the world and lose his own soul. Spiritual rewards are much better than physical rewards. When we, see, when, we, when we give to, for, for, for the, to, to earn the glory of man, it is simply physical. It is simply physical. But when we are rewarded by our Father, he can be spiritual. So yeah, God is who we ultimately give to. All of our giving ultimately ends up at God's desk. He sees it, and he accounts it, and he judges it. My prayer is our giving to God will be pleasing to him in Jesus' name. We'll move on to the second point. God is the provider of our gifts. God is the provider of our gifts. Let's turn quickly to 
Ecclesiastes, we we'll read chapter 5 uh, and verse 19. Thank you. So it says, as for every man to whom God has given what? Riches and wealth. And given him power to eat of it, to receive his heritage and rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God. I'll take a few moments to just break this down. What do we see that God has given man here? He's given him about four distinct things. One, he has given him riches and wealth. And then he has given him the power to do what? To eat of it. And then to receive his heritage. And then to rejoice in his labor. Four different things that God has given. And you know, what's, one thing that's interesting uh, in, in the secular world is that people take all of this for granted. When we see people acquire wealth, we think, well, it's because they are so smart and it's very intelligent. That's why they've acquired wealth. But we don't realize that, you know, the fact that you acquire wealth doesn't mean that you get to enjoy that wealth. Let's turn quickly to Ecclesiastes chapter 6, verse 2. So keep in mind those four things. Let's read from verse 1, Ecclesiastes chapter 6 from verse 1. There is an evil which I have seen under the sun, and it is common among men. A man to whom God has given riches and wealth and honor so that he lacks nothing for himself of all he desires, yet God has not given him the power, given, God has not given him the power to eat of it, but a foreigner c consumes it. This is vanity and it is an evil affliction. If we think about it, we will know examples of this even in our contemporary world. People who have acquired so much wealth, but they cannot enjoy it. Either because they are struck down by some kind of illness or, it, or because they just die prematurely. So the fact that we have anything that is good, whether it's wealth or a talent, it's a gift of God. The ability for us to even use our talents, even as we desire, itself is a gift of God. So it's one thing to have the talents, it's another thing to be able to use it. You know, when I... Um, Every, when I was growing up, I mean, back in Nigeria, you, you know, we see individuals who exhibit, and I, I think I've seen even some of this too recently, like, you know, in the news. You see people in some village somewhere who exhibit some kind of ingenuity, engineering ingenuity. They might build something that is pretty amazing. You're like, wow, this guy is so smart. You know, you wish if someone like this was born in the U.S. and was attending Harvard, you know, what, what would he have made of his life? But he has the talent. So the, the fact that you are in a place where there's squalor all around doesn't mean there's no talent there. In fact, I, 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 I read recently about some Nigerian kid whose parents just moved to the U.S. recently, and then he won a chess tournament in New York. I mean, I don't think his parents have been here for more than two or three years. They were in the northern part of Nigeria, and they, got, they basically became refugees. Because of, but you can imagine that guy was back there. He will have the talent, but mm, where's the power to exhibit it? So the fact that we have talent and we're able to demonstrate it is itself a gift of God. And so when we have this understanding, then we can then see why Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, verse, uh, from, uh, from verse 1 to 4, why Jesus calls those who gave lavishly, why he called them hypocrites. We can see it because the reason is because those people were being celebrated because of the large gifts they were given, the sizable gifts they were given, even though they were not the originator of those gifts. That is why they are hypocrites. And the other problem with that is that, you know, when that sort of environment is created where people feel that, oh, you have to give a big gift before God can accept it, that can discourage other people. It can be discouraging. And, you know, so we thank God because in Luke chapter 21, verse 1 to 4, Jesus talks about the, the, about the, the widow, the poor widow who was given, who had only two mites to give. People who went ahead of her gave bountifully gave a lot but we thank god that she was not discouraged i mean ask yourself if you see people dancing forward and dropping big wads of hundred dollar bills and all you had in your pocket was just a dollar bill will you not be intimidated i mean let's be honest won't you be a little bit a little bit intimidated i have to go after those people if they had told me before i would have gone before them you know so that people will not notice me but now after all these people have gone and 
toss down big wads of dollars, I am just going to go there or drop coins in there. And everyone will hear my coins chinking, ping, ping, ping. Wouldn't you be intimidated? And so this is one of the problems of having a wrong understanding of God's view towards giving. It's not the size of the gift that matters. It is the heart with which the gift is given. And so if we have this understanding, this would take away from us the pressure, the misconception that God only desires big gifts. You know, remember as Abraham himself said, when God had asked him to give a very big gift of his son, he told his son, the Lord will provide his own sacrifice. The Lord himself. He himself would do it. So if we have this attitude, then that helps us in a couple of ways. One, it helps us from having this pressure that we have to, of our own, come up with big gifts. Or come up with a big talent. Oh, my talent is still forming. I'm not fully there yet, so I can't use it for God. No, use it for God where you are. I don't have large blocks of time. I can only spare 30 minutes. Use that. Because it's not the size of the gift that God is looking for. What is God looking for? He's looking for the heart with which it is given. Our own role when it comes to giving, just to come to the main point, is our own role is simply obedience. It's just obedience. God himself will provide his own sacrifice. God himself will provide his own gifts. And so if you see your brother, you know, giving a big gift or has a you know, greater talent than yourself, do not be intimidated and they are using it for God, do not be intimidated. They are just operating in their own obedience. Focus on your own obedience. May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. We should realize that God has given us an abundance, and it is out of that abundance that we, we with humility, and with, we give. It's out of that abundance that with humility and obedience we give. We should always realize that without God's grace, the absence of God's grace, we are not capable of acquiring any talent or any wealth. Or even, and even if we did, we can't guarantee that we can use it as we desire. So may the Lord help us in Jesus' name. Even as our time is far spent, let's move on to the third point here, which is that it is with our heart that we give. And just a couple of verses here that I want us to just note down. We may not read them. 2 Corinthians uh, 9, verse 7, which is very popular and tells us that God loves what a cheerful giver. At some point in time, up to the point of the Christian Reformation, the church itself was stuck in all kinds of heresies for generations, for centuries, where people were doing things that they thought was pleasing to God, but was in fact not pleasing to God. And it was only by God, by his mercies, by his grace, about 500 years ago that the Reformation came. And then we, have our, we are able to hold our own Bible, carry our own Bible, and study it for ourselves. But prior to that, for, for centuries, the church itself was stuck in all kinds of heresies, thinking they were pleasing God, but actually not pleasing God. And so I think for us, we should humbly reflect on ourselves and ask ourselves, the things that I do, the things that I believe in, how much of it is actually pleasing to God? Where did I pick it up from? Where did I learn it from? Could it be due to a poor understanding of Scripture, or could it be that I've been copying wrong role models? I think it's a question that we should constantly and humbly ask ourselves. Because what we saw in the Scripture today was that this was the day of reformation for the Jewish people when it came to the acts of giving. What Jesus preached to them was that point of reformation for them, where their hearts were opened to see that they had been going down the wrong path when it came to pleasing God in the area of giving. And so we should, every time we come into God's presence, whether it's in reading of the word, listening to the word, meditating on the word, or in prayer, we should realize that it's an opportunity for us to be reformed by the word of of God, to be reformed by God himself. So as God himself has said in John 17, 17, that we will be sanctified by his truths. How many of us realize that sanctification is an ongoing process? Sanctification continues to cleanse us. 
Because the Bible also says in Ephesians 25 to 26 that Christ's loyalty is talking about how the husband should love the wife. It's talking about how Christ loves the church and he constantly cleanses her with what? With the washing of the word. In other words, the church itself is not completely pure, not on this side of eternity, but it's constantly being washed. And if we humbly hearken to the washing, then we can be reformed. In one area or the other where we may have the wrong understanding of what God asks of us, we may be reformed. I want to finish up with just this verse, which has always been an encouragement to me. Always been an encouragement to me because, you know, the Bible says in this side of eternity, we know in part, and we prophesy in part. And so you're always like, oh, wow, am I really understanding what this word is saying to me? But uh, um, Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 3, verse 15 after he talks about pressing on towards the goal, he doesn't consider himself to have attained or comprehended. In verse 15, he says this to me that, is, that I always find encouraging, and I hope you find it encouraging as well. He says, therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. What this says to me is that even if I have a misconception about the word of God, but as long as I stay there, as long as I come to it with humility, God himself will reveal to me. God himself said, if any of you think otherwise, in other words, if any of you disagree with me, this is Apostle Paul, because he's writing, say that if any of you have a different opinion to me, op opinion to the word of God on any of these matters, God himself will reveal even to you. But how will that happen? It happened from verse 12. He says, I do not think that I have already attained, but I press on. I press on towards, press on so that the Lord may lay, to, 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 to lay hold, uh, let, let me read that, uh, Philippians 3, 12 says, not that I have already attained or I'm already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ has also laid hold of me. This was a man who was aware that he was not perfect. This is Apostle Paul we are talking about here. He was, con he was very well aware that even the word of God could continue to wash him. He was aware that even the word of God, he himself still needed constant cleansing. And so even as we reflect on these words, I pray that it's with, with humility that we'll approach the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you, Lord, because the Bible says that your word, O oh Lord, it brings light, gives sight, gives light, brings understanding. It clears away all of the darkness that may pervade aspects of our heart and our mind. Father, Lord, even as your word has come forth today, Lord, we pray, Father, our prayer, O God, that it will shine upon those areas where we are still falling short in the name of Jesus. Whatever areas that we think we may, despite our intentions to please you, we may still be falling short, oh Father. Lord, we pray that you will use these words to shine your light upon it for, the, for our conviction, so that we may be cleansed, so that we may be sanctified, oh Lord, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we pray that none of these words will stand against us in the day of judgment. But by virtue of your word, oh Lord, we may constantly be renewed in our mind, oh Lord. We may constantly be transformed, O Lord, in our mind. We may continue on the path of holiness, O Lord, that you have called us to, O God. Blessed be your name, mighty Father. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. Let's share the grace and fellowship, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Surely, God's goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Praise the Lord. Have a blessed week in Jesus' name.